All right, and we are now recording. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Southwest Florida Sex uh, monthly meetup. We meet the third, third third Tuesday. I'm going to get my days right one of these times. The third Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. We are meeting only virtually right now due to the current pandemic, COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, someday we'll meet again in real life. And uh, but I think what we'll do is is we are going to continue having the virtual component too because we get some guests from uh, further away outside of the area, outside of the state, sometimes even. Uh, so we welcome those guests that are coming in. If anybody here is not in the region, thank you for showing up and attending our little meetup group. Hopefully, you learn something new and enjoy yourself while you're here. Uh, so in the area for Southwest Florida Sec or where Southwest Florida Sec is at, we have several other tech groups. We are uh, um, I guess a budding growing area for tech groups uh, trying to raise awareness for a variety of different things, one being cybersecurity, which we cover, as well as the OWASP Bonita Springs group, which meets the first Tuesday of every month. And then we have Southwest Florida Data Meetup, which Daniel, our presenter tonight, runs. So Daniel, if you could give a quick blurb on it. Sure, thanks, Mike. So Southwest Florida Data is all about uh, all things data really, I know it sounds redundant, but data visualization, machine learning, uh, analytics, um, databases, uh, any data topic is fair game. Uh, it has included some things that are almost related to security as well. It meets uh, on the first Monday of the month. Um, still haven't been able to secure a speaker for next month, but I'm trying to see if I can get someone from a graph database vendor to talk about how to use graph databases uh, for security actually. Um, so. Stay tuned on that. We still haven't confirmed, but that's the plan. All right, thanks, Daniel. And we're looking forward to hopefully getting a, a talk out of them. That's, that's what, Neo4j? Right, yep. All right. And then we have Southwest Florida Coders, which I don't know if we have anybody tonight. Do we have somebody here tonight from Southwest, Southwest Florida Coders? check the attendance. All right, well, we have Southwest Florida Coders. Uh, a lot of times they meet twice a month. One's usually, one used to be a collaboration meeting uh, just to get together, help each other out uh, with a variety of different projects, ask questions, learn something new. And the other is generally a tech talk. I checked their meet, out, meet up page today and I didn't see a meeting coming up for them. So I think they're still, still to be determined as well. Uh, so we'll check in with them later. There is also Pi Ladies of Southwest Florida uh, for women and basically women in coding learning Python. Um, they're open to anyone to join, but uh, definitely for women for coding. And there is the WordPress Meetup Southwest Florida and Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, uh, which is a nonprofit trying to promote the technology industry here in Southwest Florida. So upcoming events, we've got a bunch. Uh, you wouldn't think so because of everything that's going on, but uh, luckily a lot of organizations have moved over to be virtual meetups. So first up is tomorrow afternoon from Isaka, South Florida, which covers this area as well. Uh, their chapter is meeting at noon to give a kind of lunchtime learning on the five steps to security validation. Uh, should be an interesting talk. I know I'll be attending. Then there is the OWAS South Florida chapter, not to be not to be confused by OWASP Bonita Springs, because we are in Southwest Florida. Uh, OWASP South Florida is meeting tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Uh, they're gonna be talking about detecting complex code patterns using semantic grep. And then moving on, we have ISIS South Florida chapter on Thursday at 6 p.m. They have two talks going on. The Spider's Web, Navigating the World of Identity by Jacob Grimm. And then the second talk will be Making Sense of Splunk Enterprise by Jonathan Singer from up in Tampa, so that should be a good talk. Hack Miami uh, is gonna be on 829, talking about WMDs for the information age. And there was a um, secondary title for that, but I felt it was too long to add to this page, but basically it's about EMPs and the impact on technology if they were to occur. I've seen a similar talk up at Jacksonville B-Sides last year, and it's a really good talk, uh, definitely thought provoking. So if you've got time, feel free to attend. Uh, by the way, all these um, all these meetups are free to attend for anybody. You don't have to be a chapter member. 
uh, OWASP Bonita Springs. Uh, again, that's our group it meets the first Tuesday of every month. So on the first Tuesday, it happens to be September 1st. And uh, just go ahead and watch our meetup page. We'll probably continue talking about the OWASP top 10 and maybe go through another one of the Try Hack Me uh, lessons since that worked out pretty well in the last meetup. Southwest Florida Data Meetup, as you heard from Daniel, uh, is working on hopefully getting a graph database company to come in and give a presentation. And that would be, I think, on 9-7, unless that date changes um, based on availability and whatnot, because that would be the first Monday of September. It's, it's late uh, this September. Usually, Daniel happens right before we do. <laughs> this time's a little odd because you're happening after us. And then uh, Sarasota InfoSec Community is going to meet on 9-16, September 16th at 6 p.m., talking about fake news and deep fakes and their impact by Eric Cron from Know Before. So that should be another good meetup to attend. Again, it's free. Southwest Florida Coders, like I mentioned, is to be determined. So just continue watching their meetup page for announcements. Or if you're in Slack, uh, maybe they'll announce it there as well. Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership. I looked on their page. I looked up on their meetup. I couldn't find anything. I could have swore that they had something coming in either later this month or in September meeting with Sygent again to do a talk, but I could not find the announcement. Uh, does anybody else, does anybody here have that announcement? Uh, I don't have the announcement, but it's next Tuesday. And I could Sygent drop the meeting? link. Yeah. Oh, you have the link? All right, I was gonna say, I got it sent before, so. All right, so if you drop the link here in chat, if you have it real quick, and then drop the link on Slack as well for those who uh, will miss this meeting. Uh, for those of you who didn't make it out to the in-person Sygent meeting uh, a few months back, it was really good. Um, they have some good technology about locking down uh, data on their on storage. And then we have B-Sides Orlando. So the big announcement this Monday, they are going to have it. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be back in April. It got postponed. The rumor was it was going to be September. That got changed now officially. Monday, it was announced that the, well, was it Monday, Friday? I think Friday it was announced. They had a, they had a short, I guess I didn't look at Slack. They had a short uh, YouTube video, pretty funny spoof on uh, um, Ian, well, I think it was Ian uh, in, yeah, I'm getting nods, good. I was in the bunker <laughs> eating a Slim Jim, the last one, with last one roll of TP left. So it was a pretty good spoof. Uh, announcing that they are going to do B-Sides Orlando, B -Sides Orlando uh, virtually 11.6 through 11.7. So it's November 6th and 7th. November 6th will be their training sessions, also virtual. And then the, all the talks will be on the 7th. If you had purchased a ticket, ticket previously, you can transfer it on Eventbrite to the new event without having to repay. Of course, if you repay, they'd like that too, because it helps raise money for uh, whatever they're raising money for and to support the yeah, okay, good. So they're raising money for ILF. Awesome. Um, and help support the infrastructure of putting this all together as well. So, and then uh, their, set, their training sessions for the six haven't been announced yet. Uh, sounds like they're going to have a lot more than they were going to have physically. So that's good. There'll be even more things to try and choose between. So good luck. I know I'm looking forward to grabbing one of the sessions once they announce it. Uh, so that's it for now for announcements. Does anybody else have announcements for tonight? All right, no further announcements. Okay, so that's, that brings us to the slide. Tell us your needs. Uh, what are you looking for? Are you looking to hire somebody? Are you looking to be hired? Is there a specific knowledge you're looking for? Questions, topics, presentations? This is your time to speak up. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Eric Stefanko, and I'm currently looking for an entry-level uh, IT job. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm also a uh, I'm a senior at FGCU. Uh, I was lucky enough this summer to uh, work uh, in information security uh, for a financial services company. And so, in the next couple months, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to be kind of following along with a lot of change uh, as part of the organization. And you know, I would be like eager to learn 
uh, and try to get ahead of the curve about maybe some threat and vulnerability management type of topics if anybody has some expertise uh, in that field or even some type of uh, malware engineering experience because I know that's coming soon. Uh, so if anybody uh, has some good resources or uh, topics to share on that note, I'd be really appreciative of that. Oh, and I could also add that even if it, it, it's not here now, uh, you could also find my uh, profile on the Slack channel. You could message me, uh, whatever else. Uh, um, my name's Kevin. So. All right. Thanks, Eric and Kevin. I know we have a, we'll have a presentation coming up. I didn't have it on the upcoming events, but next month we have a presentation coming up uh, about malware and, rever and reverse engineering. Uh, using Ghidra. So that should be a really interesting talk for you. Uh, oh, really, Mike? That sounds really yeah. good. Good deal. Thank you. Yeah. It's a professor from Dakota State University uh, is going to come and give us, not come down, but virtually present uh, that presentation. He's uh, a big in malware reverse engineering. I found him on LinkedIn. I've talked to him a few times now, and it should be a pretty good presentation. Oh, it does sound fantastic. Yeah, and he also sits on the board for this organization that supports Suricata. So um, trying to maybe get a talk out of that organization at some point too. Oh, there you go. That sounds yeah. great. So I guess uh, now that we're talking about upcoming talks, <laughs> it's a good uh, um, lead into it. So yeah, we have the malware reverse engineering with Ghidra coming up next month. And then October, we have a very special guest, thanks to Shane and facilitating this. Uh, we're going to have Robin Dreek uh, come in and give the presentation on his trust model or trust methodology. I'm not sure if it's a methodology or a model. Uh, so that should be a really good uh, talk. He's done the talk at DEF CON before uh, amongst, and amongst other conferences and, and speaking engagements. He was the, what, director of counterintelligence or yeah. Okay. The uh, yeah, chief of counterintelligence behavioral analysis program for the FBI. So think of uh, uh, criminal minds behavior analysis team, except for serial killers. Instead, he, his job was to flip spies. A very long title to say he was a spy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, hopefully he'll bring some interesting stories to talk about as well. Uh, so we can maybe try and keep them a little bit longer after his presentation to tell us some stories. So we'll see. Uh, then either in November or December, we haven't settled on the on the month yet. We'll have somebody also come in and talk about uh, computer and digital forensics, who used to be. I don't think she still is. I think she used to be in law enforcement and worked for the NSA at once as well. So kind of got a small theme going on there of bringing people in from three letter agencies. So we'll see how that goes. And then uh, whatever month doesn't get taken up, we are looking for uh, presentations for that month. So if anybody has something that they'd like to put together and give a talk on, it'd be much appreciated. Uh, or if you have leads to people who would want to, uh, feel free to post to me in Slack and I can try and follow that, follow that down and then get us somebody in to give a talk. Okay. So with that said, we are into our presentation side of things. We have, again, Daniel giving us a presentation on Elastic with Packet Beat for network analysis this evening. And Daniel, I'm going to let you take it away from here. I will stop sharing so you can take it over. And then I think I need to make you host. So do you want me to make your lab account the host? No, this, make this one first. I'll, yeah, because I have the, the presentation on this computer. All right. All right, so it looks like... There you okay. go, you should be able to share now. Awesome. All right, so hello everyone. I think uh, most of you have met before. If we haven't, my name is uh, Daniel Fernandez. I will be sharing, what's going on here? Second. Hmm. Okay, hopefully, there's, I'm seeing a, one second, sorry about that. This is something about 
privacy preferences on Mac OS that I have to approve soon. I'm not sure why it was in before. I would just blame it on that update that happened earlier that took your whole place down. Yeah, I think that, I'm afraid that was it. Share on Zoom on Mac, it asks you. I think I have to quit actually. So I'll rejoin, give me one second. Let me make you host, Mike. Sorry about that. So I can. Yeah, otherwise we'll kill the meeting. <laughs> Since if you're a host, you leave and it might kill the meeting. I know it happened at one of our previous talks. All right. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Okay, maybe it did it. Uh, can you make me host again? I'm not sure what happened there. You are now host. Excellent. All right. So hopefully you'll see my screen shortly. Yep, got it. Yep, see you. All right, so sorry for that. Um, so we're going to be talking about a little bit of the elk, elk stack in general. So that includes Elasticsearch, Logstack, and also Beats uh, or, um, and, and Kibana, of course, to, to visualize the output. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of uh, background on all these components if you're already not familiar with them. Uh, just a very quick intro about myself. Like I said, I think most of you have met, but I'm a product manager. I've been working on data analytics products for the past eight or so years. I recently also joined uh, Georgia Tech as a graduate student in cybersecurity, where I'll be focusing on cybersecurity policy, data privacy specifically. Uh, if you want to connect on any uh, social media channel, feel free to do so, and feel free to send me an email too. I can post it on the chat later. So before I start, um, I, I have a lot going on this past few days, so I didn't get a chance to put a presentation together. So as they say, good artists copy and great artists steal. So what I did is that I, in during my research and trying to gather content for this presentation, I found this very uh, great presentation and design uh, from this gentleman that is in Egypt. So I reached out to him over Twitter and told them if I could use his uh, presentation or, or the slide decks. I mean, um, I'll be going over the contents, not the original content that he covered, but uh, it are his slides. So thank him for that. And um, sure, so the magic of the internet here. Now, in terms of the agenda, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why you would want to uh, first capture data or logs, or in, in this case, packets uh, into the Elastic Stack. Uh, why is it good to do so in, in this particular technology? And then some nuances about um, how to set up the environment if you want to optimize for certain things. And lastly, I've been capturing uh, data on my lab computer for the past four, four and a half days. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to see some interesting things uh, using all the features that I'm about to talk about. Uh, feel free to ask any questions along the way. If you have any questions, uh, you can interrupt at any chat or ask your question at any, at any point. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so the story, logs uh, or data, right? So th there's a lot of use cases uh, for, for logging information, whether it's the packets or uh, actual application logs. Uh, and these include things like application monitoring. So you need to understand when different resources of your application are up and running, if uh, there's some uh, perhaps even uh, hardware issues where you're running out of uh, disk, you're running out of memory, you need to be able to constantly monitor different areas of your application. However, an important and more relevant to us is uh, security uh, related type of analysis. So there's a lot of different interactions that happen uh, over the network and even within and, and inside of applications so being able to not only capture, store, index, but also analyze all this data is really important and is very useful when you're conducting an investigation or even troubleshooting. So the main challenge with this type of data and with logs and just data in general is that there's a lot of different formats, right? So uh, depending on the technology, the, the operating system that you're working in, on, a uh, specific application, there's there could be a lot of uh, discrepancies in the way that the data 
gets logged. And then when you're trying to uh, consolidate all these things and analyze it and, and put it together in a cohesive, coherent way, uh, it, it gets very messy and very complicated. So I thought <laughs> this is very funny, right? So there, there's locks everywhere, especially now uh, things become even more complicated when you're starting to do uh, container-based uh, uh, applications and, 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 and specific uh, deployments where you have a lot of separate services running in different places. So you end up having a lot of logs, a lot of data being passed around and, and it, it's a really like Woody's face here uh, sums it up pretty well. So what are some of the problems? I think I covered uh, some of them already, like uh, the non-consistent format of, of the logs, uh, the, the timestamps also can be different depending on the system that you're on and, and that can uh, create a lot of headaches because the timestamp for, for time series data analysis is, is very important, especially if you're trying to do anomaly detection and things like that, which we'll go over it a little bit later. That typically means that you're gonna have to have or before uh, what we're about to learn today, you, you had to have a lot of expert knowledge in individual uh, file types and log types, and then you have to somehow bring all these things together. You, you need to uh, convert uh, certain uh, timestamps or data types in, in the specific files that you're bringing in to make sure that you can do uh, operations or any subtraction addition, anything else that you may wanna do with the time. And, Usually what happens is that in order to achieve all this, you create a bunch of custom code. So I figure, I, I actually put this uh, cartoon here, um, talking about, uh, check out, I made this fully automated data pipeline that collects and processes all the information we need. It's a giant house of cards built from random scripts that will completely collapse at any moment. Uh, input, does anything weird, and then it basically collapses. Like every data pipeline that is not built uh, correctly or, or future-proof, you, you, any, any uh, data discrepancy that comes into the data pipeline is gonna throw a wrench into the engine and then every, everything breaks and, and that's annoying, right? So this is where, uh, and I swear I don't work for Elastic, I just uh, uh, recently started looking into the tool and, and there's a, a lot of great use cases for it. So this is where the, this ELK solution comes into play because it started putting together a lot of the components that address all those nightmares or issues that I mentioned earlier. So Elastic, the, the company, uh, started as a, 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 search, uh, a search company or uh, initially trying to solve the, the problem of enterprise search. So it's essentially a big index or small index, depending on how much data you have. And they started creating a lot of uh, optimizations that make managing an index uh, a little bit easier. And we'll go into that uh, later. But then over, over time, they started putting together additional tools that facilitate the process of both uh, generating the data that you need to analyze, but also analyzing the data. And that's where Logstash and Kibana come in, where Logstash is a place where you uh, make sense of all this data coming from multiple sources and kind of like organizing it neatly to ship it into the index. And Kibana is the, the user interface or the visualization BI layer call it many different things that helps you make sense of all these things, right? So starting with uh, Beats, which I, I guess I skipped, uh, and it's gonna be the, the core of what we're talking about today. I, I first wanted to introduce uh, Beats as a whole. It's an open source, it's, it's a set of data shippers that you can install, uh, whether it's in, in servers or endpoints, and there's a lot of different uh, type of uh, data shippers that exist, and here, uh, most of the ones that are listed on the Elastic website at the moment. So you have things like FileBeat that looks at gener uh, general log files of uh, operating system level uh, type of files. You have MetricBeat that has uh, more specialized type of metrics that could be interesting for someone that's doing application monitoring or DevOps, things like that. Then you have back packet beat, which is very specific for network data. So you're able to do uh, packet capture and again, handling all the uh, nuances of, of all these different data sets. You have one for Windows when log beat, you have audit beat that looks into uh, seeing if uh, files change over time. So you basically, you can set up almost like a, uh, not a listener, but you, you set up the, this, uh, this uh, program that basically looks at directories and then it tells you over time if files have changed inside of those directories and then it 
can generate alerts and, and give you useful insights of like, oh, there's these files that we know shouldn't change, have changed, now we have a problem. Uh, then you also have uh, Heartbeat, which is uh, uptight monitoring. So this is more like getting uh, very regular, uh, very regular intervals, just uh, generic uh, uptime metrics about an application or a host, a, a, a laptop computer, it really could be anything. And uh, function B to haven't explored uh, too much, but um, it, it's supposed to be a, a serverless shipper. I assume that is for if you're using uh, things like uh, Lambda functions in AWS, being able to monitor the performance of all those uh, serverless type functions in whatever cloud provider you're in. It's my assumption. Again, I'm not too familiar with this one. So we're gonna focus on packet B for the most part and it's what I set up mostly in the demo. So it's not gonna be as uh, comprehensive, uh, uh, meaning bringing all these different types of data because I didn't have the time to set it up. So that's where, what we're gonna be focusing on for today. So the, the good thing about Beats uh, and all these uh, different shippers that I discuss is that they have a very intuitive uh, configuration files where you're, you can very easily find uh, how you wanna capture data. Sometimes it uh, lets you configure things like what kind of compression do you want? How much data do you want to uh, process at a time? And then you also configure where you're sending that data to. So there are two options. One option is to send it directly to the index and that's the simpler way, that's what I did. Uh, you can also, uh, I'll explain in a little later in the presentation, other options for it. But uh, what I wanted to highlight is that it is a very straightforward process to install all these shippers and uh, configure them. And the config files are very well documented. So it's really easy to find out um, what anything is in that configuration file, which is great for someone that's new or someone that's not a developer like me. Um, so Lockstash is uh, another component of the Elk tag, Elk stack that is the L and that is used for processing uh, data. Uh, if you may want to do a specific processing to that data before you send it to the index and that's what Lockstash does. One example here is that you would get a file like the one on the left and it will normalize that data and put it in a JSON-like or JSON format so that it can be saved in the Elastic Index and it's easier to use uh, later where you can now use uh, those field names uh, to be able to do graphs, visualizations, and even machine learning models, which we're gonna see uh, later in, in the demo as well. Finally, Elasticsearch, and this is the core of the the Elk stack, and this is a distributed search and analytics engine. What does that mean? It's really uh, an inverted index uh, that lets you uh, store data that can be retrieved later, whether it's for aggregation and operations or just for general search. So this is something you can also use for uh, any application that requires search. So it's a, it's a very extensible uh, tool. And actually in, in the cybersecurity community, other uh, open source projects have started to adopt Elasticsearch uh, as a way to, to store data in general because it's so easy to use and, and very reliable. So I, I talked about an inverted index. I just wanted to spend some time uh, explaining what exactly does that mean. So uh, when you're storing the data in this format, what you're trying to uh, store is specific uh, terms and then be able to assign a location uh, or a location to them. In this case, we have three documents, uh, documents one, two, and three. And the generic process that happens before you index something in an inverted index is that you run it through a stop word list. And what that means is that you're going to try to extract uh, terms that may not give too much meaning and that are not so useful when you're performing a search. So things like articles, um, uh, you see here, A and around like four words that are not really meaningful too much uh, for, for the context, you would extract them or you would not index on those and you would actually only index on the terms that are useful for you to retrieve later. And this is both to uh, save space and how much data you're sending to the index, uh, but it's also uh, very much performant if you're conducting a, a, a big query or something like that. So in the setup of Elasticsearch, um, and, and 
in the configuration that I use, I use the simplest, which was Docker, and I'll go over that a little bit later too. But I just want to emphasize that if you're deploying this for a uh, in production, let's say, right, and you're capturing a lot of data, uh, there's a lot of different tools and features that you can use within Elastic to make sure that uh, your system is as performant as possible. So you may uh, want to uh, configure specific types of nodes of index uh, in the index to do uh, different tasks. Uh, but also, uh, these node types have uh, very specific functions that uh, can be optimized and when you're sending like a machine learning job you can have a dedicated machine learning node that has specific hardware that may be more useful for what you're trying to do so you can think of it as for example a machine learning node may want you may want to have a higher cpu on it and more memory than perhaps a coordinator node where you're just uh, routing requests that are going writing data to or retrieving data from the index uh, from the index so what i'm trying to say here is that uh, the architecture is very flexible and allows you to scale the system in different ways. And obviously, the more data you're throwing to it, the more considerations you have to uh, give to uh, this particular architecture uh, nuances. So the configuration file here for Elasticsearch is just highlighting uh, that you can have uh, clusters of, of nodes. You can have uh, very specific nodes, like I said, whether it's uh, for only ingesting data or only for storing data or only for machine learning and things like that. And again, the configuration file is very straightforward uh, to, to use. Uh, so if, if you have time, I would definitely recommend just check out uh, the, the whole ELK stack. It's, it's pretty straightforward to use. Lastly, uh, related to Elasticsearch, there's, uh, everything is a REST request uh, for Elastic. So whether you're creating a new document inside of the Elastic Index or you're reading or updating or deleting. It's all a uh, REST uh, request and here's an example of what that looks like. And this is um, uh, the default host for Elastic Search is 9200. That's why all of them are on here pointing to that one. But obviously, like I said, if you have dedicated processing nodes, you may want to do different things. Lastly, Kivana, and this is probably the more uh, exciting uh, part of the stack because this is what the, gives the end user uh, the ultimate uh, experience of, of how, to, how to make that data useful for whatever task you have at hand. So what it does is that it connects directly to the index and uh, it lets you create uh, a lot of different visualization types depending obviously on the data that you have in the system. Uh, but the best part about it is that you can load a lot of out-of-the-box uh, Kivana dashboards that come from uh, specific use cases. So, for example, if uh, Elastic, the company, has dedicated a scene product, uh, so they have out-of-the-box dashboards for that that you can load into your index, and on day one, all you have to do is throw data with uh, something like packet beat and you already have an out of the box reports and dashboards that you can use uh, so you can get up and running really fast without even having to understand how to create your own visualizations in Kibana. So Kibana also has a lot of out of the box dashboards for application monitoring. Uh, it has dedicated packet beat dashboards as well, which I'll show you. And Again, it's just very flexible and also has like a querying interface. Uh, hopefully you see my mouse here and I'll point you in the demo too, but there, it has an interface with KQL, which is like the, the main specific language for Elastic that you use to query the index. Um, and if you're familiar with solar type of queries, uh, it's not exactly the same, but uh, it's a bit similar to it. So it's also great to explore data if you want to query it instead of just visualizing it at first. So this is ultimately what the architecture will look like in a more production environment. In my case, like I said, I have everything in a single machine. It is actually running on Docker, uh, but normally you would have data come and it's only monitoring a single host. Uh, sorry, yeah, I saw, I see Shane has raised his hand, maybe a question. It is Kibana only work with the, the Elasticsearch or is it, will it work with other sources yeah. of data? Do you, do you know? That is a good question. Um, you are able to, as far as I'm aware, you're able to load uh, other log files or files and visualize them using Kivana. I, I think if you're asking about 
if you're if you can point it to another data source like maybe a relational database or something like that is that where you're we're leaning towards or something else yeah just uh anything in general that i might want to visualize can it accept other sources of data as input I, this is the first i've heard of it and just from the visual it looks pretty impressive yeah yeah so yeah the chart types are, are pretty uh, look very nice i think um so what you can do is try um, I, I can try to maybe find, I, I ran into a tutorial, but I didn't have a chance to set it up. But what you can do with Kibana only, I believe, is that you can drop a file, like a CSV file, and you may be able to visualize that CSV file in Kibana. I don't know if it automatically persists that data to the Elastic Index or not, but I know that you're able to drop a file and visualize based on that. So if you have something in Excel and you can export as a CSV, then you should be able to do it. And also if you have, uh, if you query from a database and you export it as CSV, you might be able to do it. I haven't tried it myself, but I can maybe point you with, uh, to a couple of resources to be able to do that. Thank you. Sure. So um, yeah, again, the, the idea here is that you're gonna have a lot of different hosts sending data uh, and if that's the case, you probably ship that data to Logstash. You may have some ingestion uh, workflows uh, set up to optimize for certain things instead of sending the raw captured data to the index. So that's when you're, uh, when you have a production system, you may want to uh, leverage more a little bit of what Logstash has to offer for you. Okay. Um, there we go. So, and this is just another example. Like I said, you can send data directly from Beats into the index if you want, which is what I did, or you can pre-process it in Logstash. And you can scale all these things um, uh, pretty well. So you can have multiple Beats uh, instances for specific metric types or, or data types. And then you can have multiple nodes for uh, Logstash nodes to process that data and scale that way. Then, like I said, for the index itself, you may have specific nodes for ingestion only, others only to store the data. And also you can scale uh, the instances of Kivana that you have. If you have a lot of end users hitting at the same time, you might want to um, provision additional instances because it, it can get pretty data intensive, especially like any visualization tool, right? If you are not filtering your, your queries too well, you may be pulling a ton of data at the same time. So depending on the users that you have, you may want to create and provision dedicated instances of Kibana. Last architecture view is you may also uh, use a message queue uh, like Kafka or any other where you're publishing data to that messaging queue. That messaging queue sends the data to Logstash and then Logstash again sends it uh, to Elasticsearch. This would be a even more, let's say robust architecture if you have a ton of data that is being sent. Uh, but again, this is just uh, some reference architectures in case you're wondering how to scale this thing uh, if you love it and you wanna send all your data to it. So there's some similarities of, between Splunk and uh, Elastic. Uh, here are some highlighted things. I mean, they both have their own uh, domain-specific languages that you use for querying. Uh, one of the things that gets usually highlighted, uh, depends who you ask, is that uh, Splunk may be more memory efficient than Elastic, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Also, it can be uh, more complex to deploy the Elastic stack, like I mentioned, because you have uh, dedicated nodes or you may want to have dedicated nodes and uh, Splunk is more of a standalone implementation and quote unquote simpler to install. But the caveat to that is that Splunk can get pretty expensive because usually they license you uh, depending on the data volumes that you're going to process. So the more data you throw at it, the more expensive it gets. And for Elastic, usually it's just a more flat fee or flat price where obviously the more data you throw at it, you'll be responsible for the infrastructure uh, but the pricing for Splunk can get pretty high pretty fast if, if you don't know what you're doing or if you're throwing too much data to it. So that's something to keep in mind. And here's just a trend of uh, how both of these have uh, become very popular uh, over time. Uh, this graph is not too up to date, but uh, you probably heard, uh, have heard 
more and more about both of these tools, specifically in the cybersecurity community, because uh, there's a lot of data to be processed and analyzed. So what hopefully we learned from this presentation is that uh, this, all these nightmares that I highlighted about handling all this log data or even network data uh, on your own is a bit of a nightmare, but there's a lot of tools like the one that we just presented that help you both ship the data, uh, make sense of it, store it, index it, and then also visualize it and, and make sense of it. So now, uh, unless there are any other questions, I'll jump to the demo. Okay, let me start transitioning to, I'm in another computer, let me just switch the host again. And probably lose video, or maybe I'll just stay on this one. All right. So let me know if you still can hear me because I'm not really facing the microphone anymore. Um, yeah, you're good. All right. So now, Weird, okay. Doesn't let me share from here for some reason. Sorry about that, one second. Try this again. I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. Give me one second. There's something wrong with the Zoom application on this computer. I'm gonna have to. Oh, maybe it's not installed, it seems. Um... Sorry folks, uh, the, the demo gods are not with me today. This is where we need to have one of those um, intermission cartoons, the old fashioned intermission cartoons they had at movies. Where they're like, let's all go to the snack stand, get popcorn, hot dogs. And... Yeah, hopefully you can get some, uh, do some good editing before you post the video. <laughs> but it uh, looks like it might work now. Okay, great. I think it works. Um... Okay, so let me make this computer host again. All right, so hopefully you should be seeing my screen now. I'm sharing a, a BM here. Yep, name Ball. Great, so what you're seeing here, let me first, uh, let me first walk you through the, what's running. So I, I, like I said, I, I have it running on 
Docker. So I can also share with you guys the, the specific Docker file that I use for this. Um, the way it's running is that there's three different containers running. There's one for Kibana, there's one for Logstash, and there's one for Elasticsearch. And they're all running in the default ports and have the very secure credentials that uh, come out of the box, which it's a bad practice for a security meetup, but uh, bear with me here. Um, so once you have all these things up and running, the next thing you have to do is that you have to configure packet beats. And it's just a matter of uh, pulling a file running it in, in this machine and then going through that configuration file where you're pointing the Kibana to the right index and you're sending your, your packet beat uh, data to the, to the index itself. Once all that is done, you end up with something like this. Uh, you, you log into Kibana in the, in the default port and you're going to have, if you load all those out of the box uh, dashboards that I mentioned, with something like this, where you have a lot of different uh, packet B dashboards that give you different things. So for example, uh, out of the box comes this thing called DNS overview. And when you click on it, it's going to go into the index and pull all the DNS data that the packet beat has captured in this host. So this is not gonna be too exciting because it's only one host. Normally you would have uh, data from multiple hosts coming here. So you can see a lot of, uh, where uh, the source host and the destination, IPs, all that good stuff. Uh, but it's, this is pretty insightful already, right? So it gives me a lot of details around the DNS request status and what happens over time. Uh, I can also get a breakdown here of uh, the different uh, clients or different IPs where the data is coming to them from, uh, the type of DNS query types that are being sent, also here on the bottom left, you also see uh, the top 10 uh, questions and the domains uh, that they're going to. And uh, here at the bottom right, uh, some DNS response codes according to all these requests. And then on top of that, you can also get things like uh, response time for those requests, uh, minimum, maximum, and average. Uh, but again, and then you can also start asking all those questions that I mentioned uh, using that KQL querying language. The other thing that is very, very good is that it has an out of the box machine learning feature. So I set up this machine learning job only based on one, uh, I'm basically looking for, uh, I'm, I'm doing anomaly detection on specific uh, outgoing uh, IP addresses. Uh, and when you go to explore, and I think, yeah, this was only for the first time that I run it, because uh, then the environment crashed and I couldn't refresh it. But you can change what that target field is for anomaly detection that you're trying to find. So it could be uh, things related to, again, the domain, the destination IP. But this is pretty cool because in, I swear, less than five minutes, I was able to set up this job and I get this dashboard here that tells me, and again, it's not gonna to be too exciting because it's mostly internal communication because it's only this one host, even though I was uh, trying to do some BitTorrent seeding and stuff to see if I could get some exciting data, which I'll try to show you later. But the idea here is that you can set up in less than five minutes an anomaly detection job on any field that you like, and it'll give you uh, the breakdown here with even a severity score on that anomaly uh, the timestamp of what happened. And then if you scroll down and, and uh, drop down here, you get additional details on why exactly that was considered an anomaly. And here you also get a description on uh, how many times more uh, was that event occurring than any other event uh, that the system had at that point in time. So that's also very nice and neat. The other stuff that you have here uh, is that you can use Kivana to explore the raw data and create your own dashboards as well. And, and that's also pretty neat. But one of the most exciting things that I found about this is that you can start creating graph visualizations based on the data that you have in the system. And if you were doing this from scratch and by yourself, uh, it's, it would be very time consuming. And one of the most interesting parts about this is that it creates a relationships on its own based on the data that you're sending from the, from the shippers. So normally you have to provision a graph database, you have to create a graph data model, and then you have to start asking questions using a, a graph 
like language like we talked about neo4j earlier they have like their own unique uh i think they call it i, I forget what cql or I, no sorry uh, i forget Gra i was thinking graphql but maybe not graphql uh mm, i'm not sure but yeah might basically be, might, that might be microsoft <laughs> yes yeah, so you you would need basically uh knowledge of graph databases you have to know how to write the data model you have to know like java to write that data in and here you can create a graph with like three clicks you say create a graph select a data source i don't have too many things happening here so packet beat and then from here i can start selecting which fields i want to use for this graph data so let's say i want to do something like domain and uh let's say destination domain and i want to do stuff like ip destination ip source ip And I just, whoops, I just click here and it starts already working on building this graph for me. And it takes seconds. And again, this is very flexible. You can start adding even stuff like ports maybe. That could be interesting. And again, just click here, it updates the whole thing. Or should, yeah, still working here. Great. So you see it dynamically updates all the relationships and I don't have to be an experienced developer and have knowledge of graph databases to be able to do this. What I did earlier, if I can find them, is that I try to, I was running a lot of different VPNs to see like how the data will be, uh, or using different VPN locations to see how the data will be captured. And then I, I did notice some strange traffic, but I was also seeding some torrents. <laughs> I'm not sure um, if, if that was uh, the reason, but I did find, where was it? I did end up finding uh, a IP address that was based in Ranana, Israel, which is where my current employer is based, but this is the, not a work computer. So I thought it was interesting that for some reason, this computer was sending data to the city where the company I work for is headquarters, but um, I did not intend to do that in any way. But the whole point of, of this thing of the graphs here is that it makes it really easy to start finding, uh, to help you find relationships in the data that you already have. And you don't have to be an expert in graph databases to be able to achieve that. Um, the other part here is not going to be too exciting because I didn't put enough data is the, the, like I mentioned, they have like a scene module that you're able to funnel alerts into Elastic. You're able to put agents on different endpoints and devices, and it starts, uh, receiving all this, uh, host events, uh, audit beat, like I mentioned, if I had set up like, uh, file change, uh, rules and things like this, this file shouldn't change for whatever reason, file beat. Uh, Windows type of uh, log data as well, you would have in one single place uh, the ability to view everything that's going on. And there's a lot of different uh, pre-built dashboards, like I said here, so not too exciting. This is only running in one computer, but it'll give you the breakdown by host, um, user authentications if that's happening, unique IPs, source and destinations. Uh, and then it has also built-in network specific type of uh, charts which i'm not sure um, right this is the one that has the map up so that's the thing I, I forgot to mention earlier what you can do also is that when you're generating the data one of the transformations you can do to the data before sending into the index is that you can put geo uh, tags on things like ip addresses and you can then derive things like uh, which city uh, it, it is in which country and then this map would be a lot more exciting because you will have all the data flows coming to and uh, from the different locations where the data is going uh, but you still get here a lot of useful information source IPs destination IPs uh, details and if I had again those geo tags you'll get more more cool stuff on the destination countries um, I mean there's a lot of out-of-the-box uh, visualizations here so I can uh, ramble probably for 20 more minutes, but I figured uh, I'll probably end it here. The other things to highlight is that uh, there are other uh, dedicated areas on here that even let you monitor the 
the health of your elastic stack. So if you go here to the bottom, oops, click on the wrong place. Or I think this is the one that went down when I restarted. Uh, but basically it gives you uh, details on if you have multiple nodes, it tells you about your index, your index health, how many documents are in the system, uh, are there any issues with memory? Are there any issues with storage? Things like that. So it's very self-contained and everything is in here, both for the monitoring of your uh, tools, uh, but also for any data that you have indexed, indexed that you may want to visualize. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Any questions that you have? Hey Daniel, yeah, actually I do have uh, one question. Uh, did you, I, I know you said it kind of has a uh, scene component, uh, and I was wondering if you got to dabble at all with like the rules and alarms uh, within uh, Elk. Uh, the, like, does it allow you to assign a risk rating based on a certain type of uh, amount of, or sorry, based on certain rules that you create? Is there such functionality there? I believe there is. Uh, honestly, I didn't get a chance to to set that up. I know. Um, yeah, you can you can build rules. You can also, um, yeah. Uh, Again, I, I didn't have time to set it up, so I, I don't have too much detail on that. No, yeah, no worries. I was just curious. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Recommend any good resources for reading up on Elk or documentation? Yep. So the Elastic website has a, a lot of great documentation. Uh, what I'll do actually is in the next. Uh, give me like a day or so, I'll compile all the links that I used to set up what I have on here. Uh, that it's literally, I, that's just the other thing. Let me see if I can actually, so I provisioned this machine because I, I wanted to show you how fast you can get up and running with this thing. So I set up a machine in DigitalOcean that's not too heavy. Um, here I'm in the terminal. So I'll show you literally like the, the commands you have to, I don't know if this has Git or not, one second. Oh, that's great. All right, so all you have to do to get the Elk stack up and running with default credentials, again, not, don't do this for a production system, obviously. Uh, oh, looks like it doesn't let me paste in this terminal here. That's a shame. Uh, I'll quickly type it, I guess. So here I'm uh, copying a repo from someone that put together all the Docker files and all the different things that are neither uh, that are needed. Sorry, I can't multitask for my life. It may just be me, but I'm not actually seeing your terminal screen. Did that Ooh, I think I'm just sharing. One second. Hopefully, you can see it now. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, So here I'm basically um, pulling this thing that has the the Docker Docker file, the uh, Docker Compose file. Um, I, I won't go into too much detail on how it's set up, but after you copy that file, all you have to do is use Docker Compose command, which is basically now calling all the instructions that are specified in this uh, in this file, and it's saying I want this uh, version of this uh, Docker image that contains uh, the Kivana. I want this version of Docker image that contains Elasticsearch and I want this for Logstash and I want you to assign it to this default ports that I want and you do this. I think it might take, well this is because I want to do it here because it'll be faster. So you see it's just downloading a lot of Docker images uh, with all the dependencies and all the stuff that you need. Um, so this should take roughly less than a minute, hopefully, if the digital ocean bandwidth is great, which it is. So let's see. So there's a lot of images and, and that's the, the downside with this is that the images get a little bit large. In this particular case, I think some of them were like upwards of a gig each. Um, so you cannot do this in a, like one of the things I wanted to do is be able to run this maybe on a Raspberry Pi, but it's definitely not going to work. You need a lot more memory um, 
Oh, maybe you can install the agent on the Raspberry Pi if you want to like put it next to your router or something to capture all the traffic there and then uh, ship the data somewhere else. Um, so here's already starting up and it's up. So now you have Elasticsearch, Lockstack, and Kivana running. So if I go to this IP address, um, do we have to share something else again? One second. Oh, I have to, yeah, I have to configure something. Sorry, I forgot to configure something. So you won't be able to see the, the Kivana instance directly because I have to do something with the networking in this uh, droplet in DigitalOcean. But basically you saw how, how fast you can set it up. It's like three, three commands. Hopefully if you have a fast enough internet connection in two minutes, you have an elk stack up and running uh, in, in your lab machine. Cool. All right. If there are no more questions, I'll hand it back to you, Mike. And thanks again for having me. And thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Daniel. What a great presentation.